Good evening, Lifeliners. What a joy and a privilege it is to be able to stand here today and preach to you the Word of God once again. Um, before I go into my message, how about we just bow our head, close our eyes, and commit this time to God in prayer. Amen? Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us. I pray, Father, that as I'm about to preach your Word, that you guide me, you strengthen me, Father, that the word that you have given me will go out in power and in clarity, that all your children who are listening, that they will be blessed, that they will receive something today. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, Lifeliners, you know, now we're all back at home, stuck, you know, because it's MCO once again. And... For a lot of us, we might be feeling a lot of emotions, you know, a lot of sadness, depression, anxiousness, worry. And I just want to encourage you today that it's in times like these that we need to strengthen our faith and keep believing in Christ. Just keep believing. And that's why I entitled my message today as in times like these. So you might be wondering, what are these times that I'm talking about? Is it MCO? No, okay. I'm just going to share with you um, a few characters from the Bible that went through very hard times that you will be able to relate to. Because I know I've related to a lot of them. And I'm going to share with you um, what they did and how they overcame their situations. Amen? So um, the first character is Deborah. And she went through the demands of life. So in Judges 4 verse 4 to 9b, it talks about the story of Deborah. And it says here, Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She went for Barak, son of Abinom, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them out Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly, I will go with you, said Deborah. So the story of Deborah is very interesting. You know, she had a lot of roles and responsibilities that she took on. She was a prophet, she was a judge, she was a priestess, and a lot more that she did. And for a lot of us, we might find ourselves overwhelmed. So many things on our plate, so many things to do. We might be feeling like it's too much, too much to bear. But Deborah, she never complained. Don't you think that's very interesting? For a character to have so many things going on for her to not complain once. The key here being, she believed. She had faith in the Lord God Almighty that he will lead her through no matter what was on her plate, no matter what role she had, what responsibility she took upon herself, she believed. Amen. And let me move on to the next time, the next situation you might find yourself in that another character went through. And that is when a longing is unfulfilled. So this we can see in the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And Zechariah and Elizabeth, you know, they really wanted a child. I think we all know the story, right? But let me just read it for you. In Luke 1 verse 5 to 7, it says here, In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. Pay attention to this. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God. 
observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So Elizabeth and Zechariah, they both really wanted a child, but they were just so old they couldn't conceive. And a lot of us, we might find ourselves in that situation maybe not bearing a child, but we might find ourselves in a situation where our longing is unfulfilled, where we've been praying and praying and earnestly seeking God to do something in our lives, but nothing happens. Nothing happens. And this is what happened for Zechariah and Elizabeth. They really wanted a child, but nothing happened. But remember how I asked you to pay attention to that one verse that one sentence in Luke 1 verse 6 both of them were righteous in the sight of God see Elizabeth and Zechariah even though their longing was unfulfilled one thing they never did was gave up on God they never dropped down what they were doing and said ah God you're not going to do this for me I'm not going to do anything for you. They never once said that. They just kept believing in God, kept believing in God. And even though for one small moment, Zechariah doubted when the angel Gabriel, you know, told him that Elizabeth was going to bear a child and he was like, are you sure I'm a very old man? You know, even then, after that, you can see that Zechariah still believed. You know, it says here in Luke 1 verse 63, he asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. So the name John came from Angel Gabriel, which of course came from God, that Angel Gabriel asked Zechariah to name his child, you know, of course, so that the story of Jesus can be fulfilled, the finished work of Christ. And you can see here in this verse itself that Zechariah, even for that one moment of doubt, he still never gave up. He still believed and he named his son John after what the angel Gabriel told him when he had that moment of doubt. Because he knew that no matter what, at the end of the day, it was God who is fulfilling that promise in his life, even if it's at the very last second. And the same with Elizabeth in Luke 1 verse 25, she said, the Lord has done this for me. They still had faith. They still believe. They didn't rely on themselves. You know, sometimes a lot of us might be feeling after a very long time of something not happening and suddenly it happens, we might think that we did it ourselves. We might think it's all because of us. But this story of Zechariah and Elizabeth goes to, shows, goes to show that no matter what timing the promise of God comes in, it is still the promise of God in your life. And it will come to pass when you believe. Amen, church? So the next one is in the story of Isaiah, and it's through bad news. So Isaiah is a prophet, as we all know, and he had a lot of visions from God. But there was one vision in particular that really shook Isaiah. And it says here in Isaiah 21 verse 3, Therefore are my loins filled with anguish. Pangs have seized me like the pangs of a woman in childbirth. I am bent and pained so that I cannot hear, I am dismayed so that I cannot see. And in some translations, it even says, you know, I cannot bear the news. And he was having a vision so intense, so severe. But Isaiah never gave up. And a lot of us, you know, we might receive bad news. We might receive news that is just too dampening on our spirit. Some of us might have lost our job. You know, some of us might have something happened in our life that was just so much. There was just too much for us to bear. But Isaiah never gave up. 
he kept believing. It says here in Isaiah 40 verse 3 to 4, He said to me, and this is God speaking to him, You are my servant, Israel, and you will bring me glory. And I replied, But my work seems so useless. I have spent my strength for nothing and to no purpose, yet I leave it all in the Lord's hand. I will trust God for my reward. You know, Isaiah was very, very trusting in God. Even when the news was too much, when he had that vision of the fall of Babylon, he was like, oh my gosh, it hurts so much. It's too much. But he still kept doing what God asked him to do because he trusted that his reward was not here, but his reward was up there. His reward was beyond what human eyes can see. It was eternal. And Isaiah believed that. And I think part of the reason why Isaiah's faith stayed so strong despite this bad news was because he was so honest to God about his doubt and his frustration. And he believed in God's purpose. He believed in God's plan. Sometimes when we receive bad news in our lives, we might think that it's not God's plan, that it's not God's will for our lives. But let me tell you this, if you are standing here right now, or sitting down, as a lot of you are, and you're watching this message, this is God's plan for your life. This is God's will, God's purpose for your life, despite the bad news, despite the bad outcome. Because everything that has happened in your life has brought you to this very moment that now you are saved by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. Amen, church? Now let me share with you another character who went through another tough time, and that is Moses, when there is no way out. You know, the story of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt is a very interesting story. And as we all know, there was a point where they came to the Red Sea before it was parted, right? Before they could cross over, there was something in their way. And let me read to you. It says here in Exodus 13, verse 14 and 16. When they came to that point, Moses told the people, Fear not, stand still, firm, confident, undismayed, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace and remain at rest. The Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the Israelites shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. You know, in the story, you can see that Moses came to a wall. He came to a point where there was literally no way out. But what did Moses do? Immediately, when all the Israelites were complaining and murmuring and grumbling and they were saying, oh, you've led us out here to die. Oh, they were saying all those things. Moses never gave up. He kept believing and he said to them, do not fear, do not be dismayed. You stand still today because the Lord will lead you out. The Lord will lead all of us out. And what did God do? He led them out. See, Moses wasn't sure of God's plan. He wasn't sure of what God was going to do. But yet, he kept believing. He kept believing that even when there is no way out, God will make a way. So if you find yourself in that similar situation, when you feel like there's no way out, there's no room to escape, be like Moses and know that there's always a way out for you. Amen, church? And another one, another character, another time that they went through that you might be able to relate to is when life is not how you pictured it. And this is in the story of David. You know, as we all know the story of David, from where he started out to what he became, from nothing he became a king. But David's life was crazy, absolutely crazy. You read here in 1 Samuel 18 verse 1 to 5, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him and wouldn't let him return home. 
And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. And Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. Whatever Saul asked David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him a commander over the men of war, an appointment that was welcomed by the people and Saul's officers alike. So David, of course, we all know the story of how David started off by fighting Goliath, you know, and all that. But it led him up to this point, right? This is right after that story of David and Goliath. And this was what happened. You know, Saul was very impressed by David and he wouldn't let David leave him sight. And David basically helped Saul and did whatever Saul wanted him to do. But then something happened. Saul got jealous of David. See, how David's life from one thing led to another. You see here in 1 Samuel 19 verse 11 to 12. Then Saul sent troops to watch David's house. They were told to kill David when he came out the next morning. But Michal, David's wife, warned him. If you don't escape tonight, you will be dead by morning. So she helped him climb out to a window and he fled and escaped. How David's life changed. First, it's just one chapter. But in that one chapter, so much happened. You know, you should read what happens in between. How Saul slowly grew jealous of David. It's very interesting to see that. But let me just share with you that sometimes life is not how we pictured it. I don't think David, when he started off that fight with Goliath and then he went to Saul and everything, thought that eventually one day Saul was going to try to kill him. And as we all know later, actually David spares Saul's life twice, right? But this is where David's life is at right now. Something he just didn't imagine. And for a lot of us, we might feel that way too. That life is just not what we pictured it. I can speak for myself first, you know. I quit my job last year, right? I only got my job for like one month, I think, yeah. And I immediately quit it because I felt that that wasn't the path for me. And now I'm standing here today. I still haven't gotten a job since last year. And I've always wondered to myself, always thought to myself, you know, is this really what my life is going to be? Shouldn't there be more to this? Shouldn't there be something else? I. I that was the thing in my head, you know, that I just kept thinking about. Because I see people out there, you know, everybody going out to work, everybody doing things, you know. And then I'm just here sitting, doing nothing, basically. But let me tell you, in the story of David, slowly God led David. And David did not give up on God. Let me remind you this. David always had faith. He kept believing and he didn't give up. And if you can see this in 1 Samuel 22, verse 1 to 3. So David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming, men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented, until David was the captain of about 400 men. And later David went to Mizpeh in Moab, where he asked the king, Please allow my father and mother to live here with you until I know what God is going to do for me. Pay attention to what he says there. The last thing. Please allow my father and mother to live here with you until I know what God is going to do for me. David's life was not how he pictured it, but he always kept believing in God. He never once doubted God or said, God, why is my life like this? No, he waited for God to tell him what to do next. And as I was talking about my testimony earlier, right, the same thing happened for me. I didn't know what was coming next for me, but God always knew. You know, as you all know, I got married last year with like eight hours notice, I think. And then God gave me B ministry. God gave me the ability to stand here today to preach to you. I never pictured it, not in a million years. But this was always God's plan for me. And let me encourage you today and tell you that if your life is not how you pictured it, know that it's how God has pictured it for you. This is the plan that he has for you. And you trust. Be like David. Wait for God to tell you what to do next. Because whatever is coming your way, 
even in a time like this, God will lead you through. Amen, church? Now, let me move on to the next character. Or should I say characters? So this is Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. You know, these three characters, they always stood their ground. They always stood their ground. You can see here in Daniel 3, verse 12 to 18. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. And pay attention to this. Pay attention to what they say. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now these three characters, they never wavered. They always stood their ground, held on to their belief that God will protect them, that God will be on their side. And honestly, when this happened, they didn't even knew the outcome. They didn't know what was going to happen. But they just kept believing. They said that even if God doesn't deliver us, we will still never bow down. We will still never worship Him. And for a lot of us, we might find ourselves in that situation too. You know, when we're not sure of the outcome. Will this happen or will this happen? I don't know. I know I find myself in that situation many times. But we should be like these three characters. Be like Shadrach, Mesesh, and Abednego. No matter what the outcome may be, one you know or one you don't know, no matter what it might be, keep your eyes on God. Keep focused on Christ. Keep believing, keep having that faith in the finished work of God. Because that is what's going to carry you through. And as we all know in the story, what happens next? In Daniel 3 verse 25 to 27, he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Mesesh, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Mesesh, and Abednego came out of the fire. The fire did not harm them. And I want you to know that the fire will not harm you. If you decide to put Christ first, if you decide to keep your belief, the most important thing, most important thing in your life, that fire will not harm you. When everything seems to be going wrong, when you're not sure of what's going to happen, you will not get harmed in the process. Amen? Amen. Let me share with you another situation you might find yourself in. And this is a nameless character. It was the woman healed by Jesus in Mark 5. You know, when it hurts too much. So this is another time you might find yourself in, is when it hurts too much. And there's just too much pain and the story of this woman goes in mark 5 verse 25 to 26 and there was a woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and who endured so much suffering under the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but instead grew worse have you ever gone through just so much pain 
you know, now we're under back under MCO and it can be very painful, if not physically, mentally, emotionally. It can be very draining, very tiring. And you could be like this woman here, having so much pain. But what did this woman do? She didn't, you know, sit, crawl up, you know, curl up in a ball, as they say, right? In a corner, you know, and then just murmur and grumble and be sad, depressed and all those things. Instead, she did this. In Mark 5, verse 27 to 29, she had heard the reports concerning Jesus, and she came up behind him in the throng and touched his garment. For she kept saying, If I only touch his garments, I shall be restored to health. And immediately her flow of blood was dried up at the source, and suddenly she felt in her body that she was healed of a distressing ailment. This woman believed. That's the key. She believed. She had faith in God, faith in Christ believed in his finished work, believed in him, that even just a touch itself will heal her of this ailment that she's been having for over 12 years. Just that, just like that. The same for us. Even when it hurts too much, when everything around you seems to be hurting you, keep your eyes on Christ. Keep believing in Christ, because Christ will be your source of healing, your emotional healing, your mental healing. Christ will be the source of it. Amen. And now you know what these times are. When I say in times like these, these are the times that I'm talking about. Of course, there's so many other more, but these are the ones that I wanted to focus on. So you've known these times, you know they exist, you might have even gone through some of them. But what happens next? How do you overcome these times? How do you get out of these times? What do you do? The same as all the characters, what all of them did, believe. You keep believing. And in 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 7, it says here, Brethren, for this reason, in spite of all our stress and crushing difficulties, we have been filled with comfort and cheer about you. Because of your faith, the leaning of your whole personality on God in complete trust and confidence. Do you see now all these characters that I have been talking about? All of them share the same thing. They all leaned their entire personality, their entire confidence on God and they relied on God, trusted in Him and they had faith to believe. But what is this faith that they believe in? What is this faith that I kept talking about? Faith is all about believing. You don't know how or when it will happen but you know that it will. All these characters did not know what was going to happen. They did not know but they knew that it will, that God will see them through, that God will lead them through, that God was always on their side. The same for us. We need to keep holding on to this faith. And what faith, where is our faith rested on? The finished work of Christ. So this is the gospel of God's righteousness. Christ's baptism, Christ's death, and Christ's resurrection. So every time I say, keep having faith, keep believing, it's in this. You believe in Christ. This is what your faith is built on. Christ's finished work. It was at his baptism that you were united with him. And after you've had that union with him, then you walk with him to the cross and you die with him. You die to your old life. All that you once were, all that you knew, all that you did, and you resurrect into a new life, his life. This is the finished work that we are talking about. This is what the pillar of our belief is set upon. The pillar of our faith is set upon. This is what we believe in. So I've got six very short points for you today in what to do in times like these. And that is Christ. 
keep your eyes focused on Christ. So this is an acronym, C-H-R-I-S-T. So the first thing, come to Jesus. Come. In John 6 verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. In situations you have no control of, when life doesn't seem to be going your way, when everything is too hard, when you don't know the outcome, when it hurts too much, come to Jesus. In times like these, just come to Jesus. Because He is who you can rely on. He is who you can lean on. You'll never go hungry, you'll never go thirsty ever again when you come to Jesus. And in Isaiah 55 verse 1 to 3, it says here, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Don't go to the world. In times like these, don't run to the world and run after what the world can offer you. Come to Jesus. It's free. No money. It says here in Isaiah, no money, no price, nothing. You know, it says here, he who has no money, come, buy and eat. You have no money, you still can eat, you still can buy. Because Christ already paid that price for you. That now you can enjoy it for free so you come to jesus and keep him hold on to him because it's in jesus that you can have hope hope in jesus but what is hope what exactly is hope is to trust in wait for look for or desire something or someone like to expect something beneficial in the future. I actually got this definition from the Bible dictionary, and this is what it means to hope. To trust in. To hope for means to trust in God. You can't hope in something you don't believe in, right? So what we believe in is what we hope for. That's why we have an unwavering hope if you believe in the baptism, death, and resurrection of Christ. And when you can do that, it says here in 1 Peter 5 verse 10, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. This is the hope that we believe in, that the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ even after we have suffered, will restore and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. It says here, after you have suffered a little while. So to say that suffering is a part and parcel of life. Without suffering, without any pain, without times like these, we wouldn't need God, right? There wouldn't be a need for God. So count your sufferings as a blessing. A blessing in disguise because all these things just help you draw closer to God, help you draw closer to Christ and help you grow more in your faith, in your belief and in your hope. And in Job 11 verse 18, it says here, and you will feel secure because there is hope. You will look around and take your rest in security. So in times like these, when everything is going chaotic, When the world is going chaotic, nobody knows what's going to happen. You will look around and you will find rest. You will take your rest in security. You'll be so secured because there is hope. And our hope, is it a hope that is temporary? By all means, no. It says here in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. Hope isn't just here. Yes, hope is useful here, but hope goes beyond. It goes beyond this present age. It goes eternally. See, our hope is an everlasting covenant between us and God. It doesn't end when this life ends. 
Hope is eternal. And when you can have hope in God, then you can have a relationship with Jesus. When you can hope, and when you can hope in Christ, have hope in Christ, then you can have a relationship with Jesus. You know, it says here in Matthew 11 verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now that you have been united with Christ, you can have a relationship with Christ and you can learn from him. Isn't that just an amazing gift that God has given you? That it's in these times where we can use that relationship to grow closer with Christ and learn from him. To learn from him because he's gentle and humble in heart and he will find rest for your souls. That even amidst everything that's going on, he will cause us to have rest because we have that relationship with him. Once we have that relationship with Christ, we can also have that relationship with the Father. As he says in John 14 verse six, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by, through me. In order for us to come to the Father, we have to come to Christ. So you've been united with Christ, you've died with him, and you've been resurrected into a new life, which is his life. Now you can have a relationship with the Father. And it says here in John 14 verse 7, If you had known me, had learned to recognize me, you would also have known my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. So when you can have a relationship with Christ, that relationship with the Father is automatic. From now on, you will know him and you will have seen him. Because all that Christ is becomes all that you are. And that leads me to my fourth point, identity. Our identity in Jesus. In John 1 verse 12, it says here, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In times like these, how do you strengthen your faith? How do you keep your faith? How do you hold on to what you believe in? Know your identity in Jesus. Know your identity in Christ. Because you are an heir to the throne. You are a child of God. You are chosen, adopted to be his own. Keep believing in that. Keep believing. Tell yourself. Now that you have that relationship with Christ, Christ is there to remind you who you are in Him. And it also says here in Galatians 2 verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This life that you live now is no longer of your own, but it's of God's, it's of Christ's. So when you're growing so when you're going through a tough time, know that you're not going through it alone. Christ is with you. Christ is there for you. Christ will lead you through. Like how all the other characters were let out because God was with them, the same will happen with you because Christ is your identity. And it also says here in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, but you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So this verse just further establish what I've already said. You know, our soul call on this earth now that we're united with Christ, now that we've been saved by grace through faith, is to live for him, my life for his glory, 2021. Amen. And when we can live for his glory, we can serve. Serve Jesus. It says here in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. We have to choose who we serve. How do we keep our belief? 
during these trying times, during times like these, is to serve Jesus. But we have to choose. In order for you to serve Jesus, you have to forego the world. Leave it behind. Stop running after it. Because the world will only give you pain. The world will only give you more and more suffering. It cannot offer you anything good. Maybe for a temporary short period of time, it might feel like everything is going so well. But then everything will come tumbling down in the blink of an eye. Like what happened with David, in the story of David. Everything was going fine and then suddenly Saul's jealousy got the best of him. And he wanted to kill David. Because this is that world. This is what the world will do. But be like David and keep your eyes on Christ. Serve God. Serve Jesus. It says here in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. When you serve Christ, know that your labor is not in vain. Even when your longing is unfulfilled. Like what happened with Zechariah and Elizabeth. But they kept serving. Because they knew that their reward wasn't here. They knew, like Isaiah, that their reward was eternal. That their reward goes beyond human understanding. That their reward was everlasting. The same with you and I. Do not let anything move you. When the situation is not what it seems to be. When it becomes hard, when it gets tough. In times like these, stand firm. Stand firm in your faith and believe in Christ, in the finished work of Christ, his baptism, death, and resurrection. And this leads me to my last point, thanksgiving. Thanksgiving unto Jesus. In Isaiah 25 verse 1, it says here, O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Even purposes planned of old and fulfilled in faithfulness and truth. Praise God all the time. When something is not going right, when something is going very wrong, when things do not turn out how they're supposed to be, when it hurts too much, when you're not sure of the outcome, throughout it all, praise God. Like I said before, He is the reason that you can be seated here right now. He is the reason that you are here today. Even despite all the struggles, even despite all the circumstances and situations you found yourself in, He still made a way for you and He's still making a way for you. So no matter what it is, keep praising God. Keep thanking Him. Keep giving Him all the thanks, all the praise for he will never fail you. And it also says here in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So this is what I mean to always give thanks, no matter what your situation may be. Because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Because we know that our reward is not here, but our reward is up there eternal, everlasting. So this is what we need to do, lifeliners, is to keep believing. I know I've said that word so many times now, you know, you might be counting it, <laughs> but it's essential for us, especially during times like these, to keep believing in Christ, to keep having faith in Christ. Because it says here, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse two, by this gospel you are saved, if, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. In times like these, if you do not hold on to that word, your belief will be in vain. This is the word of God. This is not me saying it. God is saying it. That if you're not going to hold on firmly, you might as well have not believed. So in times like these, Keep believing. And I've brought an end to my message, but I just want to summarize 
all my points today. In times like these, come to Christ because it's only in Him that you can have hope. And when you have that relationship with Christ, He becomes your identity. And it's now that you can serve with thanksgiving. So Lifeliners, I hope I've encouraged you and I hope this message has been a blessing to you as it has been to me. That no matter what situation you may be going through right now or might be going through later or might have already gone through, know that your labor in Christ is not in vain. Your belief in Christ is not in vain when you keep holding on to Him. So I hope you've been blessed. God bless you.